Welcome to the fourth episode of Angiopod, the podcast for vascular fanatics. This episode will cover a large portion of one of my favorite vascular pathologies, which is the abdominal aortic aneurysm. The remainder will be covered in the next episode. Ara and Zach, of course, are elated to be here after hours to record this episode. And since we can't do without Dr. Singh cracking us up while we try and record these episodes, he has joined us as well. Let's get started. Okay, so abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, you have to remember a normal size of the aorta is typically about two centimeters in diameter. Anything over three centimeters is what we consider aneurysmal. Now, there are some other definitions, but just, you know, as a general way to remember it, anything over three centimeter of uh, abdominal aorta is considered aneurysmal. The only thing to remember is uh, the, the definition of ectasia versus an aneurysm. So the way I usually explain this to students is that imagine a, a garden hose, and if that portion of that garden hose is is uh, weak, it becomes aneurysmal, and that's what we call aneurysm. If the entire pipe is, is degenerated and it begins to dilate, that's what's called ectasia. So you do have to know the difference between ectasia and, uh, and an aneurysm. And this can also play a part when you're looking at the femoral arteries as well. Uh, just remember that the rupture risk, uh, maybe AJ, you want to uh, tell us about what the rupture risk is. Uh, so from, let's say, five centimeters, six, seven. So, uh, the rupture risk is directly proportional to the size of the aneurysm based on the Laplace's law. And the aneurysm size of five to six centimeter approximately has about a 10% rupture risk uh, every year. Between six to seven centimeters, it's a 15 to 20% rupture risk uh, every year. And over seven centimeters, about a 30% rupture risk uh, every year. Okay, so when we're talking about when to repair these a- uh, aneurysms, uh, remember for males, anything over 5.5 centimeters in size, and for females, anything over 5 centimeters in size. Females are typically higher risk for rupture compared to, to men. Now, remember also when you're talking about aneurysms, there's two types uh, anatomically you have to remember. One is a fusiform, an all-round aneurysmal dilatation of the aorta compared to a saccular aneurysm. A saccular aneurysm is when essentially the aorta is normal, but one side of it, one side of the wall becomes uh, becomes aneurysmal. And typically these are considered higher risk for rupture compared to a fusiform, although there is no clear guidelines as to what size you would treat them. We typically treat them the same way, uh, same size, but uh, the saccular are considered a little bit higher risk for rupture. Other risk for rupture, maybe, uh, Zach, you can tell us about some of these. Yeah, so the other things we think about when we're concerned for rupture are uh, rapid expansion in the size, uh, eccentric aneurysm shape, female gender, smoking, hypertension, and patients with COPD are at increased risk. Yeah, the things that usually come up, especially for the in-service exams for uh, the residents, I don't know about for the fellows, but residents they typically ask is uh, smoking, hypertension, COPD. Those are three things that you have to know that will increase the risk of rupture. I think one thing we forgot to mention here is the rate of growth, which is also important when you're planning uh, surgical repair for aneurysms. And uh, the numbers you need to remember is uh, an increase in size of the sac more than one centimeter uh, per year or 0.5 centimeters every six months. Uh, And you would fix these rapidly enlarging aneurysms, even though your total size may be less than uh, 5.5 or 5 centimeters. You want to talk a little bit about uh, screening as well? Yeah, that's a uh, good point. Uh, We did talk about screening in our first episode. Uh, Remember, uh, the SVS guideline for screening is uh, one ultrasound, one screening abdominal ultrasound, for patients over the age of 65. Uh, and then the follow-up and everything was uh, discussed in detail in our first episode. Zach, anything you want to add uh, to this section of the conversation? Yeah, just in terms of classification, I remember when I was a student, I was always confused when I heard uh, the vascular surgeons talk about the types of abdominal aneurysms. So uh, the vast majority that we deal with are infrarenal aneurysms, but there's also juxtarenals that are just below the renal arteries uh, where you don't have any neck. There's um, suprarenal that are obviously above the renals, and then pararenals involve the renal arteries. 
Dr. Singh, imaging is extremely important when you're planning repair and, you know, we're obsessed with the uh, CAT scans, CT angiograms of the abdominal aorta. Why don't you tell our listeners what you as a vascular surgeon look at when you're looking at these CAT scans? So uh, typically get these CAT scans with contrast, number one. Number two, we ask for a CTA or a CT angiograms. So if we're talking about CAT scans, uh, remember the CAT scan that we want to get is a CAT scan with contrast we're talking about IV contrast, not oral contrast. So IV contrast, and we want to get very thin cuts, typically a milli, uh, half a millimeter or uh, one millimeter cuts is what we're looking for. And uh, typically this is done in what, what they call a, a triple phase. So they do it before contrast is given just to give you a, a good idea, a good overview of what, what's going on to see if there's any fluid or any hematomas or anything like that. Uh, then they uh, then it's done with the contrast, and then it's done with a delayed or usually like a venous phase type of a, a, a window, which will add a little bit more information to what you're looking at. Uh, I don't think we need to get into some of the more complex things like you know 3D reconstruction and center line flow. That that may be a little bit above uh, some of our listeners' head. Give you a little bit more detail about the aorta, uh, especially when you're planning more complex repairs. Can I also just ask you on our conference days? It seems like you guys are obsessed with uh, looking at all images and bone window. Why, why is that? Well, we're not obsessed with that. I think you guys are obsessed with looking at everything in abdominal windows. <laughs> But, you know, the reason we look at bone windows uh, is that you want to differentiate the uh, contrast versus the calcium. So when it's just too opaque and you're looking at abdominal windows, you really can't tell what's going on and what's calcium, what may be um, an occluded, even an occluded vessel, which may look like contrast. So when you put it on bone windows and it decreases, uh, I guess, a lack of a better word, decreases that intensity of that contrast. So you see the contrast is a little bit more dull and the calcium shows up a little bit nicer. Uh, and then that's why we're, we typically look at uh, bone windows. So uh, when you're planning your repair, you know, I know you look at visceral vessels that are coming off. Um, how are you going about uh, planning the actual repair based on the CAT scan? So that's a great question. Uh, and this is, uh, I guess, the, the, you know, the heart of this discussion here is when we're planning for repair, what we are looking at. And uh, of course, um, what we're looking at is the neck. The neck, uh, essentially, for those that don't know, is the uh, basically the normal portion of the aorta from the renal arteries to the point where the aneurysm starts. We need that neck because we, if we're planning for an endovascular repair, we need something for the endovascular graft to hold on to, and that portion would be the normal aorta. Even if you're doing an open operation, you still want to have an idea of what this neck will look like uh, because that will tell you about your clamping, whether you need to clamp in between the renals, super renal clamp, even uh, supraciliac clamp. Uh, that all depends on what, uh, how much room you have from your uh, renal arteries at the start of the aneurysm. Um, so now let me turn it back to you, uh, AJ. What about access? And if we're especially if we're talking about endovascular repair. Yeah, so you do want to look at the iliacs as well as the femoral vessels because you have to put up these big uh, sheets that are up to 24 French sometimes. Um, the other thing you want to look at when you look at the iliacs is the tortuosities because uh, it can be very difficult to navigate a, a tortuous uh, iliac vessel and can lead to significant complication uh, during the procedure. Yeah, and don't forget common femoral arteries too, especially now that most of uh, elective aneurysms or endovascular aneurysms are done in a percutaneous fashion. You want to make you sure you have enough room in the common femorals to uh, be able to do it in a percutaneous fashion. What about distal landing zone? How do you plan your repair uh, looking at the iliacs as well as the bifurcation of the iliac? Well, distal landing zone, obviously, you want to preserve the hypogastrics uh, as, as much as you can. Uh, in uh, certain cases, you may have to coil a hypogastric, or sometimes you may have to coil both hypogastrics. Now, there are I guess more and more fancier devices, iliac branch devices, things like that, that are made uh, to try as much as possible to preserve at least one hypogastric artery because uh, there is a, a risk of buttock claudication. What's the risk of buttock claudication when you cover both the hypos? Well, that risk is uh, quoted anywhere from about 10% all the way up to about 40%. Uh, typically, if you cover both hypogastrics, um, and but 
you know, this is a temporary problem, but it can be quite uh, disabling. So uh, if you do plan to cover both hypogastrics, it is recommended that you do them uh, not at the same time as you're doing your aneurysm repair. Ideally, it's better to stage them. You do one hypogastric, bring the patient back two, three weeks later, and maybe go ahead and cover the other one. Give them time to build some collaterals. Once that's done, now you can land your graft, if you need to, into the external iliac artery. That's this Again, this is only if you cannot land it in the common iliac. Uh, that's a nice review of what to look for when you're planning your repair on the CT. But Dr. Singh, you guys keep asking us about uh, the specific numbers in terms of neck diameter, uh, neck angulation, etc. Um, you should give us those. Well, that's quite a demand. I guess I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll have to answer that. So, you know, w- we used to ask a lot more about these when the graphs were, I guess, not new, but when we were limited to some of the, the graphs. But this is always a, a moving target. But, you know, a few things to remember. You want this aorta to be straight. The straighter the aorta, the easier it is to implant the device. So typically an angulation less than 60 is what you need. Anything over 60 degrees is usually a contraindication. Again, this is uh, a moving target. There are newer devices. There are newer trials. There are angulated devices that are uh, coming out or, or in the future. So, but for now, angle less than 60 is what you want. In terms of the, the length, the neck length, the obviously the longer the neck, the, the better it is. But you need at least a centimeter of, of neck. It's typically suggested you know, 1.5 centimeter, uh, but somewhere around a centimeter to 1.5 centimeter at least in the length. And diameter, there are devices out there that can treat up to, uh, the, the device size is about 36 millimeter. I think the largest device out there. So, uh, you know, you need at least, or I guess the smallest size would be at least 30 millimeters in diameter of the aorta, 30 to 32 millimeters in diameter. Uh, just a quick question, Dr. Singh. Any role of uh, doing an MRA or uh, catheter-directed angiography in these patients? Well, uh, it, CTA is typically what's used. Uh, MR, um, uh, we typically don't use it here, but uh, there may be some physicians that are more comfortable with MRA compared to a CTA, but usually a CTA is the way to go. In terms of uh, catheter-directed angiography, now that, that really wouldn't make too much sense to use that as your uh, first line of imaging because remember, Remember, the uh, catheter director angiography is only going to give you the um, the lumen. Uh, so it doesn't mean, let's say you get a lumen of uh, three, but there's a lot of mural thrombus and the actual size of the aneurysm is about seven centimeters or so. So you're missing a lot by doing that. So the answer is CTA is thin slice. That's usually the way to go. Okay. So um, AJ, maybe you can take this one. What about IMA, right? So uh, there's always a question whether you should reimplant the IMA or you should leave it alone. How do you determine what, what to do with that? So intraoperatively, if you see uh, that the IMA has good brisk back bleeding, that signifies that you have good collateral circulation from the SMA and your colon is going to be perfu- perfused well. And at this point, you can uh, ligate the IMA. If you have uh, you know, not good back bleeding, that signifies that you need to put uh, reimplant the IMA onto the sac uh, so that it allows perfusion of the colon. So, so not good. You mean? So, if it's occluded, would you try to revascularize it? Would you reimplant it? Well, if it's occluded, it's already ligated, uh, you know, by itself. So you don't need to reimplant it. You okay. just ligate it, and that's it. And what's the scenario? Let's say you don't reimplant it and need it to be reimplanted. Uh, what What are the complications? So you need to watch these patients carefully in the post-op period. They usually end up with uh, features of ischemic colitis, and they'll present with bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain, may have a high white count, fevers. Issue now is you have to make sure that the colon is not completely necrotic, in which case they need a colectomy. Um, And the first step that you do after instituting antibiotics and fluid resuscitation is to perform a flexible sigmoidoscopy to study the mucosa of the colon. Okay, very good. One other question I want to ask you about. Let's say you have uh, some renal abnormalities or renal, I guess, renal vein abnormality. What can you um, do to, you know, control that situation with different types of uh, renal veins uh, that course around the aorta or behind the aorta? Yeah, so the the commonest thing that uh, we're going to come across is probably going to be a retroaortic left renal vein, uh, which is abnormal anatomy. 
And I uh, have to be careful here when you're clamping um, above the neck of the aneurysm, you can actually injure this renal vein with your clamps. And that can cause a lot of bleeding. It's very difficult to control. Uh, the other thing is when you're sewing your back wall, uh, just be careful not to take the renal vein with your stitches. Uh, again, it will cause bleeding. Uh, the other thing that we sometimes do see is abnormalities of the kidneys itself, which could be a horseshoe kidney. And the problem here uh, is that you cannot get exposure to your sac or your aorta because your kidney is crossing over it. Uh, so I think the better approach here would be the retroperitoneal approach where you can just flip uh, the kidney uh, towards the right side. Or in some cases, you have to go through the kidney uh, to get access to that sac. Yeah, that could be a very challenging situation because uh, remember, you're not going to have just two renal arteries. Uh, you're going to have multiple branches coming off the aorta, and um, you might have to ligate those, and you might lose a portion of the kid kidney. So that could be a very difficult situation, depending on how large that kidney is. And one last thing I just uh, want to talk about was the, you talk about a retro aortic renal vein, but there's also a circum aortic renal vein. In other words, the, the uh, left renal vein splits, and a portion of it goes in front, and a portion goes in behind the aorta, and it basically uh, you know, it encompasses the aorta. How do you deal with that situation? Um, in that case, you can um, ligate the one that lies anteriorly and your kidney can still drain through that posterior um, renal vein. Uh, and I think the kidney should do fine and you'll be able to get access to the aortic sac that way. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's say you have a scenario where a patient has a history of uh, AAA and they present to the emergency room with a shortness of breath and they're noted to be in heart failure. They get a CAT scan, which reveals a uh, 6.5 centimeter AAA. And on top of that, there's early filling of contrast or rather filling of the contrast into the vena cava. What do you think I'm getting at here? So I think you're talking about an uh, aerocaval fistula that's developed from a chronic aneurysm. Yeah, that's correct. How do you handle this problem? So, these patients, uh, typically, when you do an uh, open AAA repair for them, you have to close the fistula off because otherwise you're going to have persistent bleeding into the sac with enlargement and a possibility of rupture. Uh, and uh, how you do that is um, after you get uh, proximal and distal control of the aortic aneurysm sac and you open it, uh, you can ligate the aerocable fistula from the inside like we ligate all the collateral branches that enter the aneurysmal sac. Yeah, that's correct. Just uh, you do have to remember you're going to have a lot of back bleeding. So as you open up the sac, you're going to have tremendous amount of back bleeding from the uh, from the vena cava. So you need to put sponge sticks on the vena cava, control the vena cava approximately distally as well. Then you can over oversew the fistula. Right. Uh, what about endovascular repair? Um. Very limited experience with this. I haven't seen a case. Uh, how would you manage it, Dr. Singh? Uh, well, I'm, I just bring it up because recently we had a patient uh, with this type of a problem and we were able to treat it with an endovascular, uh, with an endograft. Um, but one thing you do have to remember is when you, there's such a high flow that when you suddenly shut down the flow of these fistulas, you, there is a potential for uh, a, you know, extensive DVT or even a cable thrombosis that can occur that's been reported. But, uh, yeah, there's not much in literature. Uh, these are rare situations, uh, but an endograft is, is a possible treatment for these. Okay, all right. Say you have a patient with uh, AAA and the patient doesn't fit the criteria for endovascular repair, or maybe you're just not comfortable doing it and you prefer an open operation. What are your um, approaches for an open operation? So there's two open approaches, uh, the transperitoneal approach. Uh, this one gives better access to the right renal, right iliac, and right femoral arteries, and then access to uh, the visceral aortic segments. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult uh, in this approach. The other uh, approach is the retroperitoneal approach. Uh, this is better for the superciliac uh, visceral segments of the aorta. Uh, it's preferred in pre Yeah, so just to clarify, it's tough to get to the right iliac as well as the right common femoral. If you have a patient on their side, you, they're going to be in right lateral decubitus position if you're performing a retroperitoneal approach. 
you can do it, but then you need to place a beanbag, deflate the beanbag, reposition the patient to get to the right side. When the aneurysm is involving, let's say it's a pararenal aneurysm or it's involving a portion of the um, of the visceral vessels, uh, then a retroperitoneal approach is usually preferred. All right, you gave us some approaches to open AAA repair. Why don't you tell us something about the complications that you expect from these procedures? So some of the major uh, post-op complications for open procedures are, you know, MI, pulmonary complications, but the most tested is the uh, colon ischemia, um, which will require a, a flexible sigmoidoscopy to uh, diagnose it, and also spinal cord ischemia. So are, are you saying that spinal cord ischemia is, is a complication that typically occurs after infrarenal aneurysm repair? No, it's... Uh, Mostly found in patients who had previous uh, coverage uh, of the thoracic character. Yeah, exactly. So if they've had extensive, that's, you know, when they talk about extensive coverage, that's what they're talking about. You have covered the thoracic character, let's say a previous endograph. Now the patient requires an infrarenal aneurysm repair, whether it be open or endovascular fashion. Those kind of patients, you typically need to put a spinal drain on, even if you're doing an infrarenal aneurysm repair, because they're at a high risk for spinal cord ischemia, typically about 10% or so. Uh, and don't forget other complications, which we already talked about, like aeroenteric fistula. These that typically occur later on, and uh, lymphatic leaks, which can also recur. Again, these are uh, rare and uh, usually just uh, you know managed conservatively. Uh, but if it does occur, it can be quite challenging. Okay, the other complication are endo leaks, and this is typically tested a little bit more than after open repair. I don't know if either one of you guys want to talk about, about the endoleaks or different types of endoleaks. Sure. Uh, I think I'll take the endoleaks. Uh, so endoleaks, obviously, every vascular conference, there's one case that comes in with uh, endoleak, and we always talk about it. So there are five types of endoleak, starting with uh, type 1, which is either the proximal or distal uh, landing zones. Type 1A is the proximal landing zone or from the neck. Type B, 1B is the distal cuff. Um, when you're saying endoleak type 1 or type 1A or type B, you're basically talking about, just so we're clear, let's say the graft slips down from the neck. That can cause an endoleak. So that'll be a type 1A endoleak. Correct. Type 1B is, let's say, the distal portion uh, gets more degenerated and now you have a leak from the distal limb or if the limb shortens. Correct. Um, and then type two is um, leaks into the aneurysm sac from the side branches. These could include, most commonly, it's the IMA. That's patent, um, back bleeds into the sac. Uh, you can have the lumbars, the middle sacral. All of these branches that are feeding the sac can continue to bleed and cause uh, sac expansion. Let's say if the sac is not expanding, what well, do you do for these? The natural history for these, uh, this kind of endoleak is actually most of them stop on their own. And actually, when these have been followed, the sac either stays the same size or actually reduces despite uh, having a type 2 endoleak. And let's say you have an endoleak from an IMA. How do you treat that? And it's causing sac expansion. Uh, so sac expansion, obviously, is an indication for treatment. There's multiple modalities to treat it. There is direct sac puncture, uh, which is a translumbar approach. Try to get access to that IMA and then just coil embolize it. So the other way uh, to access the sac is transcable. Uh, you actually puncture the sac through the IVC, get access to that sac, and then can embolize um, the IMA or the lumbar branches that may be bleeding. Yeah, that's uh, similar to, uh, I guess, sac puncture. So you can either go directly or the other way to gain access into the IMA with a previously covered endo uh, aneurysm is you go through the SMA. You find the, the branches from the SMA that connect to the IMA and coil it that way. But you you do have to remember that you need to coil the outflow as well. So you can't just coil the inflow. The outflow also must be uh, coiled. Otherwise, the sac can continue to expand. Uh, so what about type 3? The type 3 um, vascular societies divided it into uh, 3A and 3B based on whether it's from uh, the modular component um, of the endograft or uh, um, a leak from a tear in the endograft fabric. Uh, and uh, type 3, again, needs to be treated because uh, the aneurysm isn't considered fixed unless you've uh, taken care of a type 3 endoleak. So the way you do it is realign your modular components 
if it's a type 3A, um, you can do that with the balloon angioplasty of the stent or using a, a extension stent uh, to cover that defect. Then the next one is the type 4 uh, was seen in the older generation grafts where the fabric was porous uh, and would leak. Uh, but uh, the newer generations don't usually have this type of endo leak. Uh, and then type 5, uh, which is uh, now called endotension, uh, is unknown etiology of why the sac is expanding. Although on imaging, you don't see uh, a clear cut endo leak. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's a very good review of endo leaks. Uh, you talked about type 1, but I don't think we, we talked about the treatment. So let's say you have a graft that slipped down. Typically, you see this with the old anurex grafts, and you still have a neck. How do you treat that? So uh, one option in that case would be to put a proximal extension cuff, and that should cover uh, your neck as well as uh, enter the stent and cover that area. Uh, that should treat it. Okay. Now, let's say you deploy your graft. And you still have an endoleak or right by the, uh, below the renals. Um, obviously, you can't put a fenestrative device in at this point, and you're not going to go proximally. There's uh, things you can do, things like uh, chimneys and snorkels, but we don't want to talk about that right now. So w what other option besides ballooning the proximal portion of the graft? Uh, so, yeah, it sounds like the, the endograft isn't opposed well to the wall. And uh, in this case, um, you could use a stiffer stent, like the Palmer stent. Uh, which would cause a nice apposition. One reason that a type 1 endoleak can occur, uh, this is typically occurs if the neck is short or it's a very angulated neck. And for that reason, that pulsatile flow can actually uh, push the graft down uh, and, and cause that, uh, that endoleak. If you know the neck is short, it may be a good idea to put these aptus screws in. Um, these are screws that, that are um, used to place inside the graft, and they basically anchor the graft to the aorta. Um, uh, what about limb occlusion, Ara? What would you do if the, you see a kinking of the an endograft in the iliacs? You would initially try to angioplasty it first, uh, and then if that doesn't work, you would try with the balloon expandable stent, uh, see if you could open that up. Okay, so what if the patient comes in and they have come in with an occluded limb? You were not a, you had a kink, you knew it was there, but you didn't think it was going to cause a problem. Now the patient comes in uh, with a cold leg and you notice yeah, so in that case, they would require a FEMFEM or a uh, AXFEM bypass. Okay, yeah, those, that's a good way to manage that situation. It can be tough to open that, that limb up again um, because it's hard to figure out why that went down to begin with unless you know where the, the area was that, that caused the problem. Then you might be able to uh, go ahead and fix it, like you said, with a balloon expandable stent. Now, let's say if you're doing a fenestrated uh, graft and you have an issue with uh, with the renals and one of the renals gets occluded, how, how do you rescue that? You could uh, attempt to rescue with the stent uh, placement. Uh, but, that if but, but we're saying that the stent gets occluded. So what would you do? So in that case, then you'd have to do an open uh, spleen or renal or a pad or renal bypass. Yeah, that's a that's a good option. Uh, it's easier said than uh, done, obviously, especially when you're trying to fix uh, an aneurysm, trying not to go into the belly. But yes, that, that is an option. That was a brief review into abdominal aortic aneurysms. There is a lot more to learn about uh, AAAs, some of which we will cover in the next episode. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please share it with your friends and subscribe to our channel. The fun fact for this episode is that Zach is super happy that we finally have listeners from Canada. And that's because he's Canadian. Until next time, ciao.